Unit 4. Popular Science. Exercise 1. How to Grow Chives. Listen to the conversation and write down the missing information in the notes below. Hi, David. Do you like chives? Yes, I like them very much. They taste like onions. You can sprinkle fresh chives on cooked chicken, fish, or potatoes. It's very delicious with them. Do you know how to grow them? No, I just buy them when I need them. Do you know how to grow them? Yes, I grow a lot in my garden. Chives are easy to grow. Really? Please tell me how you grow them. I want to plant some in my garden. Okay. You need a bag of potting soil, chive seeds, and a pot with a hole in the bottom. Oh, wait a minute. I need a pen to write this down. I need a bag of potting soil, chive seeds, and a pot with a hole in the bottom. Is that right? Yes. Then what do I do? First, fill the pot with potting soil. Don't use soil from your garden. Second, water the soil well. Water should come out of the hole in the pot. Then, sprinkle about 10 to 15 seeds on top of the soil. Cover the seeds with a little potting soil. Water lightly. I see. I have to water them a little bit as soon as I plant them. Yes. Then, Put the pot near a sunny window. Do not let the soil dry out. The chives will come up in about two weeks. So, in two weeks' time, chives will grow. That's right. You can start to cut the chives when they are about eight centimeters or about three inches tall. Cut only about one third of the plant at one time. Why do you cut only one third of the plant at one time? Because in this way, the chive will keep growing. Ah, I understand. Can I grow them in the garden? Yes, of course. You can plant chives outside. You can grow chives outside in a sunny place. When should I plant? Plant the seeds in early spring. Chives are perennials. They will come up every year. It sounds good. I will try it this spring. Exercise 2 Who invented popcorn? Listen to the conversation and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Mary and her classmate Alex are off from school. They are going to see a film. Do you have the time, Alex? It's 7 20. We are early. The film starts at 7 30. Let's have something to drink. That's a good idea. Something smells good. Right. That's popcorn. Would you like some popcorn? Yes, I'd love some. Do you know who invented popcorn? It is said that popcorn is a delicacy that was developed by the Indians of North America. When did they invent it? Mm, it has been dated back thousands of years. I see. Do you know that the Indians were not only eating popped corn, but they also used popped corn in headdresses, necklaces, and in religious ceremonies? Yes, we have seen these in some films, and according to most sources, a deerskin bag full of popcorn was served at the first Thanksgiving dinner at Plymouth Rock in 1621. You know, popcorn's popularity grew during the Depression of the 1930s, when people realized that a little popcorn could go a long way. But its success was clinched. When movie theaters across the continent started serving the snack. By 1947, 85% of movie houses were selling popcorn at their concession stands. Oh, the movie is about to start. Let's go. Exercise 3 Lobsters. Listen to the talk 
and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Good morning, everyone. Today I will talk about lobsters. Many of our listeners wrote to me to ask if lobsters really scream when they are boiled and why they turn red when they are cooked. These are very good questions. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were sitting in a vat of boiling water, wouldn't you scream and turn red too? But in the lobster's case, there is no scream, and there is a chemical reason for the change in color. Noises are produced as a lobster is boiled alive, but the sounds are not voices. As the lobster's body heats up in the shell, pockets of air in the cavities and joints expand. If enough pressure builds inside the body, the air will make whistle-like sounds as it escapes through small openings in the shell. As for the color shift, a lobster's shell contains red pigment molecules that combine with a protein to create the camouflaging colors of the lobster. Live lobsters are usually blue-green or brown with flecks of yellow. When the lobster is boiled, the protein is denatured or deformed by the heat. The pigment remains, however, turning the shell red. Exercise 4. Jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Listen to the conversation and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Hi, Alan. Look at this picture. Do you know this bridge? Let me see. Oh, it's the Golden Gate Bridge. Do you know how many people have killed themselves by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge? I don't know. Here is the report on that. It said people began jumping off San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge almost as soon as it was completed in 1937. Between 1937 and 1990, 850 people have jumped from the bridge to their deaths. 850? That's quite a lot. In an average year, 17 people will take the plunge. Yes. This figure is based largely on the number of people actually seen jumping off the bridge and the number of bodies recovered. In some cases, a number is added to the official tally if a suicide note or other evidence is found, but only after thorough investigation. There have been a number of faked jumps by people attempting to escape the law. Why is the bridge a popular spot for those serious about their suicidal intentions? Because the Golden Gate Bridge is easily accessible and the long drop ensures a low chance of survival, impact with the water after the 91-meter drop is like hitting a concrete wall at 140 kilometers an hour. I see. Are there any suicidal people that have failed? Only 17 suicide attempts in the bridge's history have failed. I see. Exercise 5. Where do ants go in winter? Listen to the conversation and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Hi, Tom. Come here. See what I found. What's up? There are thousands of ants here. Yes, I think they are busy taking food home for winter. It's amazing. Do you know where they go in winter? Yes, I've just read an article in the newspaper. When winter comes, ants move deep into their nests, where food has been collected. They store it in their special chamber all summer. How far underground is their storehouse? 
Only the top few inches of topsoil freeze. Beneath this layer of frozen soil, life goes on in the colony. How big is their nest? The size of their nest varies from just one chamber of a few inches in diameter to vast networks. It can extend 40 feet underground and house a population of up to 10 million ants. 10 million? That's quite a lot. Yes. You know, in, Nor in North America, an ant community can consist of 12 or more main nests connected by tunnels. The entire colony can cover an area the size of a tennis court. So when spring comes, the ants have to work their way out of the nests and begin the task of gathering food for the next winter. Yes, you are right. They have to do just that. It's fascinating, isn't it? Exercise 6. How Crossword Puzzles Are Created Shirley and Chris are on the train. Listen to their conversation and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Chris, do you have the time? Yes, it's 4.15 now. How long does it take us to get to Edinburgh? I see there is still an hour to go. We will get there at 5.20. I see. What shall we do to kill the time? Shall we play a crossword puzzle? Okay, that's a good idea. Oh, Chris. Yes? Do you know who invented the crossword puzzle and how crossword puzzles are created? Well, the crossword puzzle was introduced in the Sunday supplement of the New York World newspaper in 1913. It was designed by Arthur Wynne. Mr. Wynne was inspired by Magic Square, a children's word game in which words are arranged vertically and horizontally. Wayne added empty squares and some clues. So that the player can deduce the words according to the clues. Yes. By the early 1920s, crossword puzzles were standard features of almost every American newspaper. Yes, according to a report, many crossword puzzle books have been published since then. In 1924, four crossword puzzle books were on the bestseller lists. Booksellers also experienced phenomenal sales of another type of book, dictionaries. Today, crossword puzzle makers each have their own techniques to challenge the skills of their players. Right. I know Eugene Waleska is a creator of the New York Times crossword puzzle. He begins with a theme and lists as many words as he can think of that loosely fit the theme. Yes. Birds, for example, might prompt pigeon toad, goose step, and turkey trot. Then Waleska starts to fill in the grid with the long words first avoiding words ending in J or beginning with X. He works first in the lower right corner of the grid, since it is harder to find a word that ends with a certain letter. Waleska says that when he started in this business, it took him several days to fit the words into a 15 by 15 square grid. Now, it takes less than an hour. Let's play it and see how well we do. Exercise 7. Koala. Listen to the talk and write down the missing information in the notes below. Good morning, everyone. In today's lecture, I want to look at one of Australia's famous and most loved animals, the koala. The koala is the Australian teddy bear and is the largest member of the phalangers family. The koala looks like a teddy bear. It is two and a half feet long, with ears seeming as if they were stuck on, beady eyes, and no tail. Its dense, woolly fur is blue-gray in color, 
and was used commercially for fur until koalas were almost exterminated. They are pouched mammals, of course not bears at all, but closely related to the phalangers. Koalas spend most of all their lives in the eucalyptus trees, feeding on their leaves. Their toes are armed with sharp claws, and their fingers are divided into two groups. The split in the hand, coming between the index and middle finger, instead of between thumb and fingers, as in our hand. The great toe is, is thumb-like. All of these features aid in climbing. Koalas, although usually slow and deliberate in movement, are able to spring from one upright branch to another with surprising skill. Their babies are carried in the pouch at first. Then it clings to the fur of the mother's back, riding piggyback until it is almost as large as the mother. Koalas become quite tame and they are great attractions at the various Australian zoos and parks. Exercise 8. Stamp Collecting. Listen to the talk and write down the missing information in the notes below. The collecting of postage stamps is a hobby that interests people of all ages and all walks of life. It has countless followers in every land. There are over two million stamp collectors in the United States and Canada, and among these are a great many boys and girls. The most valuable stamp in the world is the one-cent British Guiana Magenta of 1856. Only one copy is known to exist. It is valued at about $50,000. There are other stamps worth several thousand dollars, while many others are valued at hundreds of dollars. Yet, most stamps are not expensive. There are hundreds of stamps worth a few dollars, and many more hundreds that you may buy for a few cents. So you see that stamp collecting is not merely a rich man's hobby. Each stamp collector finds his own stamps fascinating no matter how much or how little money he spends on them. The reason is that there is always a story behind postage stamps. The countries of the world use them as a means of telling the world about their industries, their culture, their great men. They also use stamps to celebrate important events in their history. So, while a stamp collector is enjoying his hobby, he is also storing up knowledge about all kinds of things from every corner of the globe. Usually, a beginner collects everything that comes his way. This is the best method, as in this way he becomes acquainted with, with a wide variety of stamps. Later on, he may decide to specialize in certain kinds. But unless he has already collected all sorts of postage stamps, he will not have enough general information about his hobby to enjoy it to the full. Exercise 9. Get the right food to stay slim. Listen to the talk and fill in the missing information in the form. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our regular program on health issues. Today I'm going to talk about ways of staying healthy and slim. You know, some people seem to eat to stay alive, while for others, eating is a hobby. Do you enjoy your food? Are you careful about what you eat, or do you eat what you enjoy? Here is a very simple way to choose the foods that will keep you slim and in shape and feeling great. And you don't have to count calories. Let's divide the main types of foods into three groups according to their calorie concentration. First, we will use red for food that is high in calories. Secondly, we'll use yellow for food that is medium in calories, then 
we will use the green color for the food that is low in calories. Now, let's look at the red group. You will find sugar, chocolate, cakes, puddings, honey, jam, cream, butter, chips, peanuts, and soft drinks. Because these foods are high in calories, you should stop and think before you eat them. In fact, you should try to avoid them as much as possible. Moving on to the yellow group, you will find fatty meats, sausages, liver, eggs, milk, cheese, nuts, wine, beer, and salt. When you eat these kinds of food, you should be careful and not eat too much of them. Then we come to the last group, the green one. This group includes fresh fruit, salads, vegetables, seafood, yogurt, skimmed milk, bread, low-calorie soft drinks, tea, and water. When you eat these foods, you can go ahead and eat lots of them. You, you should use these three groups to discover a sensible balance that suits you. Remember, it is easier to stay slim than to lose weight once you have put it on. A little care choosing what you eat and enough regular exercise will go a long way to get you feeling great. Exercise 10. Our Body Systems Now listen to the talk about our body systems. As you listen, write down the missing information in the notes below. Our body is a wonderful machine. It has more parts and can do more types of work than any machine in the world. That is why we say that man is the supreme living thing in this world. Well, now let's have a look at our body systems. I'm going to go through them quickly, and then we will have a look at them in detail. Our bodies are made up of several parts. The head, neck, trunk, arms, and legs. These parts are held together by a framework called the skeleton. The skeleton is made up of bones, and it gives the body its shape and form. Bones not only support our bodies, but also help to protect important organs. The skull protects the brain. The ribs protect the lungs and heart. The hips protect, protect part of the food canal. The spine protects the spinal cord. There are different types of bones in our bodies. The main support of the body is the backbone, or spine. It is made up of a long row of small bones joined to one another. It is found only in the neck and trunk. The bones of our body are hard, white, and strong. When a bone breaks, new cells begin to grow at the broken ends. More and more new cells are formed until finally the broken ends meet and join together. To find out if a bone is broken, the doctor uses an X-ray machine. This machine can photograph the inside of the body. The photographs it takes are called X-ray photographs. The ribs can be seen clearly from it. There are more than 600 muscles in your body. They make up the flesh that lies between the skin and the skeleton. Muscles can contract and relax. Their contraction and relaxation cause body movements. They also push food through the body and make the blood circulate. Now let's see the nervous system. It is made up of three parts, the brain, 
the spinal cord, and the nerves. All parts of the body are connected to the brain by nerves. Nerves act like telegraph wires. They carry messages from the different parts of the body to the brain. Then the brain decides on what to do, and it sends messages back to the appropriate parts of the body. This system controls all muscle movement and also controls your senses. So the nervous system is very important because without it, we will not be able to feel, smell, taste, hear, and see. The brain is the most important part of the nervous system. It controls the movements of the body and sends out instructions to all parts of the body. Exercise 11. Inventor of the telephone. Now listen to the first part of the talk about the inventor of the telephone. As you listen to the talk, write down the missing information in the notes below. Today people can talk to each other even if they are thousands of miles apart. They can hear each other as clearly as if they were in the same room. The man who made this possible was Alexander Graham Bell. His invention is the telephone. The telephone sends the human voice from one end of the world to the other. Bell is famous not only as an inventor. He is also well known as a writer of books to help people who cannot speak or hear. He was a teacher of such people. This made him interested in sound. This interest led to his invention. Alexander Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1847. As a boy, he was interested in inventions. He went to the universities of Edinburgh and London. His father and grandfather had both been teachers of, de of deaf people. His father had worked out a system of visible speech. That is a system by which a deaf person can see what people say by reading their lips. Bell learned this system. He soon became a teacher of the deaf and he opened his own school for deaf people in Canada. Through his teaching, Bell became interested in the sound of the human voice. He thought that it should be possible to send sound across a distance. That is what the word telephone means, far sound. With his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, he worked day and night on this idea. They strung wires across several rooms. Each time when they thought that they had found a way, they tried to talk through the wires. Each time they were disappointed. After each failure, they made some changes and tried again. Exercise 12. Inventor of the Telephone Now listen to the second part of the talk about the inventor of the telephone and fill in the missing information in the notes below. Then one day, in June of 1875, Watson, who was downstairs, heard Bell's voice from the attic. Mr. Watson, please come here. I want you. Watson was so excited that he ran upstairs crying, I heard you, Mr. Bell. I heard you clearly. On that day, the telephone had been invented. The words Bell spoke to Watson was the first telephone message ever sent. Bell and Watson continued to work to improve the telephone. The first long-distance, two-way telephone conversation took place later that same year. It was between Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, a distance of two miles. In 1877, a telephone company was formed. The first telephone exchange was opened the next year in New Haven, Connecticut. 
It had it had eight lines and twenty one telephones. From that time, telephone systems grew fast. Two years later. There were over forty-seven thousand telephones in the United States. The telephone spread rapidly both here and in Europe. Bell lived to see millions of telephones used all over the world. He had the joy of speaking from coast to coast by telephone. He died shortly before telephone service across the ocean was established. His invention brought him wealth and great honors. He was given many medals and honorary degrees. His invention has often been called one of America's greatest gifts to the world. When Alexander Graham Bell died on August second, nineteen twenty-two. All the telephones in the United States were silent for one minute in memory of a great man. Exercise thirteen: Inventors of the airplane. Now listen to the first part of the talk about the inventors of the airplane. As you listen to the talk, write down the missing information in the notes below. The first successful trip men made through the air was in a balloon. The next step was to make the balloon go where they wanted it to go. This they did by adding motors and propellers. The result was the airship. But still, men were not satisfied. They wanted to build a machine. That would fly through the air on wings. Such a machine is called an airplane. Many people in Europe and in America worked on this concept. The first inventors to build an airplane in which a man could fly were Wilbur and Orville Wright. Wilbur was born in 1867 near Millville, Indiana. Orville Wright was born four years later. When the two, bro two brothers grew up, they built up a successful printing business, and soon opened a bicycle shop. One day, Wilbur read of a man in Germany, who had fallen to his death while flying in a glider. A glider is really a kite that is large enough to carry a man. The idea of flying in a glider immediately interested Wilbur Wright. He told Orville about it. Then he began looking through the books in his father's library. One of the books which he found helpful was a book on birds. Man was imitating the birds when he was attempting to fly. The two brothers carefully watched and studied the flight of birds. They noticed how some birds could coast through the air for long periods of time. They found that other people, both in America and in Europe, had been trying to fly. These people had built gliders too. There was one question no one had answered: that was how to balance the glider when it began to dip forward, or backward, or to one side. The Wright brothers, after long study, decided to build a pair of smaller wings before the wings of their glider. By turning these smaller wings up or down, the glider would not dip forward or backward too far. For four years, the Wright brothers studied and worked on this problem. At last, they were ready to build a glider of their own. In the fall of the year 1900, the Wright brothers built their first glider at Kitty Hawk, and the test flight was a success. Exercise 14: Inventors of the airplane. Now listen to the second part of the talk about the inventors of the airplane, and fill in the missing information in the notes below. 
The Wright brothers started to improve their glider, paying particular attention to its controls and to the shape of the wings. The new glider was longer and had a tail, but they wanted to add power to their glider. The following year, their bicycle shop seemed more like an airplane shop. Orville designed an engine which they built and mounted on the glider to produce flying power. They also experimented with various designs for the all important propellers. It was December when the Wright brothers' plane was ready for the flight. Orville climbed into the plane and started the motor. Wilbur was holding the end of one of the wings to keep the plane level. Slowly, the plane started forward. It gained spe speed and rose into the air. It moved swiftly upward, then downward, then upward again. It was not a smooth ride, but it was successful. The plane came down undamaged, 120 feet from where it had started. Three more flights were made that day. The longest was 852 feet, and the time in the air was 59 seconds. It was not a remarkable record, but it showed the Wright brothers that their plane was successful. Man had actually flown in an airplane. This was the beginning of the importance of the airplane. In 1912, after a few years of success, Wilbur died of typhoid fever when he was only 45. In 1943, exactly 40 years after the Wright brothers' first flights, Orville agreed to give their first airplane to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. On January 30, 1948, Orville died at the age of 77 after a short illness. The Wright brothers will never be forgotten. The names of both brothers are firmly and forever linked in the history of aviation. Exercise 15. Invention of the Telegraph. Listen to the first part of the talk about the invention of the telegraph. As you listen, circle the correct letter for questions 1 to 3, and then fill in the missing information in the notes for questions 4 to 14. Today it takes only a short time to send a message to the most distant parts of the world. The man who made this possible was Samuel F. B. Morse. His invention was the telegraph. Morse was not only a great inventor, he was also one of the best early American portrait painters. He gave up painting to give all his time to his invention. Then he set out to show how useful it was. After a long struggle, he succeeded. He lived long enough to see his telegraph span the United States and connect Europe with the United States. Samuel F. B. Morse was born in Massachusetts in 1791. When he was 14, he entered Yale College. He was a very good student in electricity, but he was more interested in painting and drawing. He wanted to be an artist. He was a successful painter and won several medals and prizes. On one trip to the United States, he had an interesting idea. Later, this idea developed into his famous invention. Some of the other people on the boat were talking about the speed with which electricity can travel over a wire. Morse thought that it might be possible to use electricity to send a message over a wire. This message, he thought, could be recorded at the other end. 
A message could then be sent with the speed of electricity. Before the end of the trip, Morse had drawn up rough plans for an instrument. He called it the electric or magnetic telegraph. Morse began to work out his idea as soon as he landed. He gave up his work as a painter. Instead, he chose to work on his new idea. Almost five years later, his experiments were successful. He built an instrument that made his idea work. Exercise 16. Invention of the Telegraph. Listen to the second part of the talk and complete the notes below. Samuel Moore set up his telegraph in a room at the university. People came to see it, but they could not believe that it would ever be more than a toy. Morse needed more money to build a telegraph over a distance. He could never prove what it could do if it was just set up in one room. But it was very expensive to build a telegraph line over a distance. Morse asked Congress to give him $30,000 for such a line. But many people in Congress laughed at his idea, so he didn't get the money. Morse struggled on, hoping that some day he could prove the value of his invention. He went to several European countries to try to get them to use the telegraph there. But European governments didn't want to have anything to do with his wild idea. He returned to America sad and without money. When he asked Congress for the money again this time, Congress granted him $30,000. As soon as he got the money, Morse built a telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore, a distance of about 40 miles. At first, he tried to lay his wires underground, but that did not work well. So, he decided to nail the wires to poles. Finally, the line was ready for the first test. One day in 1844, after 12 years of work, Morris stood at Washington with a group of friends. He was ready to send the first telegraph message. Another group was in Baltimore, ready to receive it. The message went through clearly. From then on, people believed in the telegraph. Soon poles and wires were spread over the United States. Then cables were laid under the oceans, and telegraph service was in use all over the world.